is so sweet to trust in Jesus, 524. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. I pray that you may be with us this morning. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Blessed Sabbath to you. We're glad that you could be here and that we are together. We have seen some of our members we haven't seen for a while. Steve and Vera, welcome to you. I know that you've been online and so it's not unusual, so welcome there. And uh, also, um, I see Michael, you have a, a, a friend with you. I didn't quite, I didn't get uh, her name. Ashley, Ashley? Right. welcome, welcome, glad to have you here. And uh, on this side, I, I note, note that uh, we have two of our faculty members from San Gabriel Academy. And so um, I, I I heard that this is Byron's classmate from San Gabriel from almost day one, right, Byron? <laughs> uh, pretty much. Let's see, what do we have? Hannah and RD, uh, welcome. We're glad to have you here. And, and, and uh, remember that our church is a constituent church of San Gabriel Academy, and uh, we, we gladly and proudly support the mission and the uh, the work of San Gabriel Academy 
in sharing and teaching the good news of Jesus Christ to many young people, whether they be our own church members uh, or uh, of our constituent churches, and especially to those who are not Christians, because that is a very important mission of, of this church and, and of San Gabriel Academy. So God bless them, and we're, we're very happy that you're here with us today. Um, after this service, we have an uh, informal lunch. Uh, I, I'm, is it now that the weather is summertime again like? Uh, is it going to be outside again, or is it bouncing back and forth? It's inside. Okay, it'll be inside the social hall after our worship services. Well, we'll join together with our Chinese section also. So we're happy that, uh, that you're here um, and that we are all together. Uh, let's just take a few seconds just to kind of turn around and to wave to each other and uh, give each other a happy uh, Sabbath greeting. All right, thank you very much. God, God bless us as we join together. Um, our offering collection is still a little affected by the, the pandemic. So we don't collect offering in the aisles here, but uh, we do have multiple ways that we can, um, can um, give our offerings uh, to, the, to God. And uh, one of them is uh, by the elevator in the other building, there's a small box that you can place the envelope with your offerings uh, into that small collection box. There are offering envelopes, I believe there's still some here in, in this building and also right next to the collection box. Then there's the online giving. If you go to the, our church website, there is the uh, Adventist uh, giving and you can uh, direct it that way or else uh, you can mail it to the, the mailbox, uh, the post office box that's uh, listed um, online and also in your bulletin. Um, this is a very high time for our, our church and our denomination as we enter into a period of a uh, uh, week of prayer. And so we encourage you to consider how God has blessed us and, and also given us the grace of Christ that we can share the love of Christ with all of those around us. So uh, we ask that you continue to, to um, consider that and consider how God has loved us and is loving us and how we can love those around us. So at this time, we will now um, turn our time over to uh, Brother Cody as he leads us in our pastoral prayer. haven't done this in a while, but uh, I think everyone pretty much had this. Does anyone, but before we proceed, um, does anyone have any prayer requests that they'd like to be made known? No? Okay. Any silent prayer requests? Okay, we'll keep going. Um, there is one prayer request that I have. There's a coworker of mine who's like kind of struggling spiritually a little bit. Um, so if you can name your prayer. Um, okay. Uh, for those that are able, I'd like to ask you to please join with me, kneel with me, as, uh, as we come together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for, uh, first of all, our health and um, bringing us all here uh, at this time uh, that we're all able to be here. Um, please be with those that aren't able to be here as well. Um, please uh, continue to guide our church as we continue to uh, navigate uh, this time through this difficult time, um, as well as our other churches, sister churches, and uh, other churches that are not as uh, painful as well. Uh, please continue to guide them. Please um, be with all um, the members here. Um, please continue to uh, be with their uh, daily lives, their busy lives, um, their health, their families, um, as uh, well as their spiritual lives and um, their connection with you. Uh, please continue to be with all 
uh, it may not have been uh, mentioned out loud, but you know what's in your heart, and you know um, what requests we have, um, what needs we have, and uh, the prayer requests that uh, uh, have been um, silently uh, brought forth. Um, we lift them up to you, um, please uh, handle them in the way that you see best to. Um, also, please be uh, with my uh, co-worker friend as well, as uh, he is uh, struggling a little bit uh, to find his way uh, with you. Um, please, uh, and in the same same vein, please uh, continue to be with all of us as well as we continue to struggle uh, uh, with you in our walk with you as well. Um, lastly, I'd like to ask that you uh, lift up uh, Victor, um, my personal friend, but also our brother as well, um, as he gives your message. Please be with our hearts, our ears, um, and his mouth as uh, we continue to learn more about your love. And as we go um, into the rest of the Sabbath day and we continue to learn more about your Sabbath and our Sabbath as well. Um, uh, please be with us as we uh, approach the end of this year. Um, it's been uh, uh, a fast but also a slow uh, 2021, um, but we are grateful and uh, we are thankful for uh, being being able to get to it uh, with each other and with you as a church um, as well. So continue to be with us as we go into this last quarter and these last final months. Um, all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, uh, after Jesenia reads the scripture reading, our speaker will be uh, Brother Victor Lopez, and we're very glad to have him here with us. And he has been involved in several ministries uh, with the conference and also with uh, different uh, literature evangelism and group ministries uh, throughout the United States. So we're very happy to have him with us. Uh, he is a friend of Ellie and Cody and Jesenia, and uh, he has a very strong uh, uh, love for the Lord. And I am looking around. Okay, I am <laughs> looking in and disjointed. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, it was Robin. It's Robin. Wow, I thought that was Ellie. That's Robin. Okay. Uh, okay. Robin is Victor's, or uh, Victor is Robin's fiance. It will make you the fiance. Okay. But we're glad. And it's a, a December date, correct? Yes. So God bless you. God bless you. We're very happy that uh, they are here with us today. And we look forward to uh, the Lord using Victor uh, with us. So, brother, uh, Sister Jessenia. Today's scripture is found in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong.
minutes. Okay. No worries. Well, first, I want to say thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the church for having me this morning. And before we start, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, Lord. I come humbly before you, Lord, that you may use me this morning. I pray for your spirit, and I want to claim your promise in Psalms 125, verse 2. It says that as the mountains surround Jerusalem, that you will surround your people now and forevermore. I pray that you may be with us this morning. I pray this in your precious son's name. Amen. Okay. So as you guys saw in the bulletin, the title was God Uses Ordinary People to Do Extraordinary Things. Right? God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. I added, I added the last part, so. It says, throughout history, God has used ordinary people in the Old Testament, the New Testament, even some of the reformers, and even the early pioneers of the Adventist church. But somebody that comes to my mind is Peter. But Peter, you know, it's, it's the same Peter, that one that walked on water. Peter the one that was there when Jesus was feeding the multitude. Peter, the one that was healing when, after Jesus had ascended into heaven. Peter was instrumental in establishing the church in the early church. But what made Peter so ordinary? I want you guys to think, that, think about that for, for a little bit. What made Peter so ordinary? What made him so relatable to us? I think it's that he was imperfect. Peter was not perfect, right? Peter was an impulsive person at times. He was a violent person. He was, he always, if you look at this in the Bible, he, Peter always had something to say. When Jesus said, I'm going to wash the disciples' feet, Peter says, you will never wash my feet from my head to my toe. You'll never wash my feet. Or, you know, Peter wasn't the most tactful person. He, at some at times, would show favoritism. But what made Peter so ordinary? It was that he was imperfect. You see, if you look in Luke 18, 19, it says, Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except for God alone. And Paul, in Romans 3, uh, 23, says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the reality is that nobody's perfect. None of us are perfect. So that's what made Peter so relatable to us. So now we're going to look at two perspectives in the Bible, in the Gospels. The first one's going to be found in Matthew 4, verse 18. So when everybody turns there, um, if you, when you get there, please say amen. It's in Matthew 4, 18 through 19. Matthew 4, verse 18 through 19. Okay, amen. Okay. And the Bible says, it says, Jesus, as he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. So what do we learn here? We learn that Peter was a fisherman, right? And then in the last part, it says, then he had... Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So what we read in Matthew 4 is that Peter was a fisherman. But did you know that being a fisherman in Jesus' day was one of the most difficult things back then? I'll read something to you. It says, fishermen worked year-round around the heat of the summer and the cold of the winter, often at night. One of the most important skills of a fisherman was making and mending the nets together. It says, made of linen and common fabric used in ancient East, these nets had to be carefully cleaned and dried or they would quickly rot and wear out. The nets often had small pieces of stone that would hold them so when they would fa throw them into the sea that they would fasten to the bottom of the sea. So imagine that Peter, most of the time he spent his time cleaning the nets. So now as we go into the next gospel in Luke, I want you to kind of just look at Peter's mood 
how he's feeling. We already know the story, right? Peter didn't catch any fish. But just put yourself in his situation. How would you feel? How would you be in that situation? So it's going to be found in Luke 5, verse 1 through 8. Luke 5. And I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version. Luke 5, verse 1 through 8. And it says, and Now it happened while Jesus was standing by the lake, by the lake with the people crowding around him, listening to the word of God. So in verse 1, we learn that Jesus was preaching to the crowd, and people were surrounding him. Right. And in verse 2, it says, And he saw the two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them, for they were washing their nets. So Peter was washing his net, right? So at this time, we already know he didn't catch any fish. How do you think Peter's feeling? If he didn't catch any fish. It's not, it's not like when you go to your job on Monday and you're like, say you don't get anything done, you still get paid, right? If Peter didn't catch any fish, he didn't get paid. If Peter didn't catch any fish, he didn't feed his family. So how would you think he felt? Was he happy? Was he joyful? He was frustrated, right? He was like, I didn't catch any fish. I've been here all night. I didn't even get to spend time with my wife. So imagine everything he's feeling. In verse 3, it says, And he got Jesus, and he got in one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little distance from shore. And he sat down and began teaching the crowd from the boat. So on top of this, Peter's not feeling that so great. He's not really happy. He's kind of frustrated. But Jesus says, he, you know, he says it gently. He's like, hey, can you push the boat into the sea? So imagine Peter. He didn't catch anything. He's frustrated. So he's like, oh, man, like, I don't, I'm, not, I'm already doing something. So he pushes the boat, right? And on top of that, he can't just leave the boat out there, right? He has to, he has to wait till Jesus finishes to put it back. So in verse 4, it says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, Put your net into the deep of the water and lower your nets for a catch of fish. So now Jesus is telling him after he finished, you know, he preached the message to the crowd. And now we see that Peter, that Jesus has something in store for Peter, something deeper than what he was preaching to the people in the crowd. So Peter, I'm pretty sure he was thinking, like, you're a carpenter, I'm a fisherman. I think if I throw the net out there, I'm probably not going to catch anything. And he's probably thinking, like, man, I have to wash the nets again after I throw it out there. So in verse 5, it says, Simon replied, and he said, we've worked hard all night to the point of exhaustion. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I'm hungry. I'm hangry. Like, I don't want to be here. I'm pretty sure that's what he was thinking. And it says, and caught nothing in our nets. But at your word, I will do so, as you say, and lower the nets again. Something I learned from Peter just washing his nets was that it's really interesting. When you really look detailed, like, in the Bible and really just pray and, like, try to study the Bible, like, I, I learned a lot from Peter just from him washing the nets. It showed me that Peter was a faithful person. He was faithful in the little things, that he took care of his stuff. He wasn't the kind of person that just threw stuff everywhere and was messy. He took care of his stuff. So now in verse 6, it says, When they... Oh, let's hold on there. So he said he didn't catch any fish. How many days or weeks did it go for Peter without catching anything? Have you ever thought that? Or maybe it was a week, a month. How long did it go since Peter didn't catch anything? Right? And then verse 6. It says, When they had done this, they had caught a great number of fish, and their nets were at the point of breaking. Verse 7. So they had singled their other partners in the other boats to come to them to help. They had came and filled the boats with fish, and they began to sink. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. You allow God into your life. Have you ever felt that sometimes, like, you're just, 
like the amount of blessings you have in your life that it doesn't just stay with you, but it overflows to your family. And then verse 8 is one of the most important texts because it goes with just showing that Peter was it perfect. It says, but Simon, Peter, saw this and he fell on his knees saying, go away from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Has it ever happened to you where God blesses you and you're like, God, I don't deserve this. Why are you giving it to me? I don't deserve this. I'm, I'm not good enough. Why do you do this to me? But it's like you're, you're crying, but it's emotion that, that only God understands, right? You see, being a fisherman was a common job back then. If we think about it in today's society, being a fisherman is a nine-to-five job. Peter wasn't getting any promotions. Peter didn't even see any efforts in his labor. So I'm sure he started to think, is this it? Is there more to life? Have you ever felt that way? You don't have to answer that. But have you ever felt that way where you're sitting at work and you're like, is this everything? After I finished my, my degree, this is, is this everything? Do I have to continue to work in the same job for the next 30, 40 years until I retire? Do you remember that time when Jesus told Peter, Peter, do you love me? What did Peter say? Yes, Lord, of course I love you. Then Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, you just asked me the same question. Yes, of course I love you. And he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, Peter gets emotional. He says, Lord, you know about all things that I love you. Why, like, why would you even say that? He says, feed my sheep. So this morning, maybe God is speaking to you and saying, Robin or Ivan or Shirley or Cody, do you love me? Of course, Lord. He's like, feed my sheep. Now, as, as we transition into the next verse, the one that Yesenia read this morning, it's in 1 Corinthians. Sorry, I overlooked what I was reading. It says, what we learn from Peter is that he wasn't perfect. But as long as you're being, as long as you're ready to learn from God, God called Peter just as he was imperfect to preach the gospel to the world. Imagine that. Somebody that was a nobody, why did God pick him? Right? Peter, it's not like Peter wasn't, he didn't, wasn't educated. He knew things. He, he obviously knew how to fish. He had some idea of how to live. Right? But he picked Peter because he wasn't, he wasn't educated by the religious um, authority of that time, right? Because if you look at back then, a lot of people were, when they would study, they were very arrogant. They were prideful. It was like, this is mine. This is what I am. Like, get out of my way. I'm a follower of Christ, like, you know, or I'm a follower of God. And he saw that Peter was teachable, right? So as long as you're willing to be taught by God, God is willing to use you in a mighty way. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So now in 1 Corinthians, verse 1 through 26 through 29, it says, and I'll be reading from the NIV just because I normally read from New King James, but just to give a little bit more like detail. It says, brothers and sisters, think of you were when you were called. Not many were wise by human standards. Not many uh, were influential. Not many of you were noble at birth, 27. But God has chosen the foolish things to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things to shame the strong, verse 28. But God has chosen the lowly things of this world and the things that were despised and the things which are not to nullify these things, verse 29, so that no one may boast before him. I mean, look at Ellen White. She wasn't perfect, right? She wasn't educated, but yet God used her. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. I'll read to you a quote from Christ Object Lessons. It's in page 79. It says, As in the early ages, the truth, the special truth for this time, 
are found not with celestial authorities, but with men and women who are not to learn to believe the word of God. In other words, he didn't choose angels. He's choosing us and perfect just as we are. He wants to do extraordinary things in our life. Who here has heard of Charles Spurgeon? Yeah? Great. I'm glad that somebody has heard of that, of him. So for those who haven't heard of Charles Spurgeon, I'm going to give you a small biography about his life. Charles Spurgeon was an ordinary boy. He came from a very, very poor family. His parents had barely enough money to feed him. Just four years after his conversion, Spurgeon, at the age of 19, was called to be one of the pastors of one of the largest churches in London. Spurgeon, only at the age... Spurgeon's sermons were published, printed every week, highly circulated in the area. He had preached to an audience of more than 10,000 people at a time. By the age of 22, he became one of the most popular preachers of his day. Ordinary person, yet God did extraordinary things in his life. By the, a- by the time of his death in 1992, he had started 66 ministries. He had preached nearly 3,600 sermons and published 49 volumes and commentaries. That just goes to show that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. I'm going to share two more stories, a verse, and I'll be done. Who here has heard of Richard Montes? Maybe recently on, oh, hey, Dave. Um, Who here has heard of Richard Montes? Anyone? He's not really that popular, but I recently came across a YouTube video about his life. And he was giving an interview, it's a two-hour interview, and he's talking about his life, and the person's asking him questions, and he's saying, Richard, when did you realize that you were poor? And he's like, I really never realized that I was poor until I guess I got into high school where I didn't really have enough, like, nice clothes, nice shoes. Um, You know, I live with a bunch of people in the same one-bedroom apartment. He's like, so I guess I really didn't know until people started pointing it out. And to give you a, a background of his story, Richard was raised in California. He was one out of 10 siblings. His whole life, his grandfather and his grand his his dad told him, "Richard, you're going to be a farmer. You're going to do you're going to pick grapes for a living for the rest of your life." And then when he got to high school, he thought to himself, "Is this really everything to life? Like is there more?" So then one of his uh, sister's friend came and she's like, "Richard, why don't you apply at this company in Ranch Cucamonga and apply for it and see if you get a job?" So he's like, I don't even know how to, I didn't graduate high school. How do I even apply? She's like, write a resume. He's like, what's a resume? She's like, well, I can help you. I can write, I can write it for you. And then we'll submit the application, see if you get the job. And he was excited. He was telling his parents, like, I'm applying for this company. They're going to give me a 401k. They're going to give me a retirement plan. We're set for life, guys. Right. And his family, obviously, they, they saw that and they're like, wow, like he's actually doing something with his life, even though it was just a regular job. He was planning to be a custodian. But what's interesting is that as time went on, th- yet again in the interview, he says, I wasn't satisfied. I was at the end of the road. Even though I was working there for three years, I was like, man, is there anything else to life? So then one day, the entire company's having a meeting. And the CEO of the company says, we need, we need ideas. We need to figure out um, what we're doing with the company, we're not really having that much success. And the company was Frito-Lay. Who here has heard of Frito-Lay, right? For those who like chips, Frito-Lay. And what's interesting was that Richard was all the way in the back, and the person's like, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter if you're the assistant, it doesn't matter if you work in the finances or in a, and um, for, like, production, or if you're the custodian, anybody can come up here and give me an idea. So then Richard took that to heart. He's like, man, I'm going to, I need to figure something out. Like, he's calling me out. I, I need to bring something to the table. So one day, Richard, he sees this, these chips that were, like, it was a overflow of chips. So he took some home, and he started making seasonings and just started putting stuff on the chips. And then the next day, he packs them in, like, plastic bags. He irons the chips, and he, like, puts, you know, his own, like, little, like, packages together. So then the next day, he goes to the company, and he brings up his idea. And at first, he's like, oh, man, I don't know if I should do this. You know, because the way the, the product looks, it's, like, really messy. It's not that, that great. 
So then the company actually loves it. And he ended up creating uh, Hot Cheetos, which is crazy, right? And what's interesting is that Frito-Lay, just the, f the Hot Cheetos itself, they make over $1 billion a year. He became a multi-millionaire. But he went from being a custodian to top executive for the company. But what's interesting, and the thing that stuck out to me at the very end of the interview, he says, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God. If it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be the person I am today. Er, all the glory goes to God. And it just goes to show that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Or we might think to ourselves, well, Victor, I'm already about to retire. I don't know if I could even do that much. Well, if you look at, if you look at Moses, how old was Moses when he led the Israelites out of bondage? How old was he? He was 80? Okay, what about Noah? How old was he when he, built, when he started building the ark? Yeah, he's pretty, he's pretty, he's, he, was, he was up there, right? <laughs> he was up there. But what's interesting is that age is not a hindrance to God. God can still use you powerfully more than you can ever imagine. I know sometimes it's hard because it's scary. It's somewhere that, I don't know, can I do this? Can I actually do that, God? But God wants to use you in a powerful way. Maybe you've thought about that. Maybe that's why you started coming back to church and thinking, I want God to use me. Well, today's the day. God wants to use you in a powerful way. See, God calls us imperfect. He calls the weak of this world. He calls those who have been despised by many. Or perhaps during COVID, when you were at home by yourself, you probably thought that you were nothing. God still wants to use you in a powerful way. You see, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, it says that God's power is made perfect in our weaknesses. And meant to that, right? You see, as I, as I close, I want to share with you one story. As you can tell, I like sharing stories. It's a story about this ordinary boy. His parents immigrated from Mexico. And his parents had nothing coming to America. He comes from a family of eight. Out of all the children, that ordinary boy was the only one that was born in the United States. By the age of 12, he was 200 pounds. And uh, by the age of 16, he was dyslexic. He realized that he was dyslexic. So imagine this. Imagine being the only one that's born in the United States and having all his siblings putting all that pressure on him. Like, you're the one who's going to lead us out of poverty. You're the one who's going to do all these things for us, but yet he's dyslexic. He can't really, he doesn't even understand what he's doing with his life. He can't even read. Yet alone, he can't even graduate high school. So how is he going to go into college? So imagine all the stuff that he was going through. By the age of 18, he had reached 310 pounds. He had low self-esteem. He couldn't talk. He couldn't say things to people. He couldn't even say his name. He didn't even like reading out loud. He would rather take detention instead of reading out loud. But seven years after his conversion, he had no door knocked in 24 different states. He went to eight European countries. He became an assistant director of evangelism for the Rocky Mountain Conference. He was imperfect, despised by many, he was weak, but God's power was made perfect in his weakness. That ordinary man is standing before you today. And it just goes to show that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. As we cl close our eyes, I want you to imagine this. God wants to do extraordinary things into your life today. But we have to be like Peter and let Jesus onto our boat. In other words, Jesus is knocking on the door of our heart today. And if it's your desire for God to do extraordinary things into your life, 
I want you to take this time right now to ask God, God, come into my life and use me to do extraordinary things for your life, for your glory. If that's your desire, I want you to ask God this morning, God, come into my life and to do extraordinary things. I'll give you a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, Lord. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.15, it says that, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. God, every single person in here has made and accepted that call. God, they want you to use them to do extraordinary things in their life, Lord, that everything that they do may glorify you. God, you use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And I pray this in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. For our closing hymn is hymn number 334, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. God, thank you for this morning. I pray that as we all travel home, as we get into our cars, Lord, that we may see that as we drive off that we are now entering into the mission field. I pray, Lord, that you may bless this church in abundance, and I pray this in your son's name. Amen.
Be seated. 